Welcome to RAD's IPMAX configuration demo. This guide will walk you through the basic steps required to configure an IPMAX unit. The following instructions are based on an IPMAX point to point application over a layer 3 routed network or a layer 2 switch network. It also applies when you have two IPMAX units connected back to back in a bench test. Prior to configuration, you need to understand your application requirements starting with the T1 parameters. This includes the T1 frame type, signaling, and timing requirements. The T1 can be framed or unframed. The IPMOX supports both the extended SuperFrame ESF and SuperFrame SF formats. For T1 signaling, the IPMOX supports both clear channel signaling, also known as CCS, and rub bit signaling, also known as CAS. With CCS, a dedicated time slot is reserved for carrying the signaling information, while with CAS, the signaling information is carried in each time slot with the data. In most scenarios, you will need a crossover T1 cable to connect your equipment's T1 port to the IP MOX. On the Ethernet end, the network port 1 should be used as the uplink. For initial configuration, you need a serial console cable to log into the IPMUX. The default terminal settings are 115200 baud rate, 8 data bits, no parity, 1 stop bit, and no flow control. You also need to set the terminal emulation to VT100. Hit the enter button a few times to get the login screen. Once you gain access to the unit, Log in using the default username SU and password 1234. SU stands for super user and grants you full admin rights to make configuration changes. The first configuration step is to assign an IP address. By default, DHCP is enabled. Disable DHCP and save the configuration. This may cost the unit to reboot, which is okay. The IPMOX supports two IP addresses, a system IP address and a pseudo-wire IP address. For the purpose of this demo, we'll assign just a system IP address. You can use the system IP address for both pseudo-wire and management purposes. Now, with DHCP disabled, configure the host IP and subnet mask. If you are utilizing SNMP, you can configure the values here. When you have a pair of IPMUX units connected over a layer 3 routed network, you need to configure the IP address of the default gateway. As shown in the diagram, the default gateway is the IP address of the connected router. The second step is T1 configuration. When setting the T1 parameters, you need to configure the transmit clock source and the line type. As I mentioned previously, the line type can be framed ESF or SF, or unframed. There are four possible configuration options for the T1 clock. Adaptive, loopback, internal, or system. When set for internal clock, the IPMUX generates the T1 clock. When set for loopback, the IPMUX recovers the clock from the connected T1 source. When set for adaptive, the IPMUX regenerates the clock from the IP packets. When set for system clock, the IPMOX references the configured system master clock. For most typical applications, the example shown here is the correct setup if you are passing the master timing source from one end to the other. The final parameter to configure on the T1 is the signaling type. There are two options. You could configure the T1 to use CCS signaling or wrap bit signaling. The third configuration step involves the pseudo wire. As I mentioned earlier, the IPMOX supports two IP addresses. The pseudo wire host IP is used when you need to isolate the management traffic from the pseudo wire traffic. The pseudo wire IP address and the host IP address cannot be the same. It is optional to configure a pseudo wire IP address. If the T1 is framed, you must configure the time slots that will be assigned to the pseudo wire bundle. 
when the T1 frame type is set to ESF or SF, you need to bind the voice or data time slots to the bundle. Take note of the bundle ID and how it corresponds to the T1. For T1 number 1, the possible bundle IDs are from 1 to 32. For subsequent T1s, the bundle ID increments by 32. For a full T1, you need to connect all the time slots. Do this by typing the letter E. For a fractional T1, you can assign the desired number of time slots. The time slots you choose do not have to be sequential, but they do have to match your end equipment. The final step is to configure the pseudo-wire bundle parameters. Please note that if the T1 line type is set to on-frame mode, you can proceed straight from the T1 configuration to the bundle connection configuration. The key parameters to be set include the destination IP address of the remote IP MUX, the destination bundle, and the TDM bytes in frame. The TDM size is dependent on your available bandwidth. If you have ample bandwidth, a good rule of thumb is to use the default size of 1, which will consume approximately 3 megabits. If bandwidth is limited or you are connecting wirelessly, we suggest using a value of 6. You might also want to change the jitter buffer setting. The jitter buffer compensates for variable delay on the packet network. All other parameters can be left at default. After completing the bundle connection configuration, you are ready to monitor the connection status to verify that the bundle comes up. You will know that the pseudo-wire connection is up if the indicator shows OK. If it shows anything different from this, please reference RAD's IPMOX troubleshooting demo for help. You can also monitor the breach statistics to verify that you have bi-directional connectivity. The transmit and receive frames on the Ethernet port should continually increase. Any CRC errors are an indication of errors at the physical layer. Finally, you can monitor the T1 statistics to verify that there are no errors on the physical T1. This concludes our IPMUX configuration demo. Thanks for watching. If you experience any trouble or have questions, please feel free to contact us.